Hello, my name is Daniel Marks, and I'd like to talk to you about a project I've been working on for the last couple of years called the RF Bitbanger. It's an off-the-grid emergency communications radio, and I think it fulfills a need that's currently unaddressed, especially in emergency communications. So this project came about as a result of a few experiences of mine. I've created many open source hardware projects and one of the issues with having open source hardware is that you often have to use specialized components and these specialized components, their availability is at the mercy of the company that creates the components. Now, some generic components you can get from many suppliers, especially if it's so-called jelly bean parts, which are available in generic forms from many suppliers. However, most so many chips nowadays are so specialized that you can only get them from one supplier and even if you can get them from another supplier you have to qualify them and it's quite a uh, involved process to do so in if you're going to build something that other people have to reproduce it seems to me to be best to use components that are generic as possible and are standardized as possible and while this does make it harder to design and build open source hardware, I think it gives the hardware more longevity. And so it makes the effort to design and build the hardware more worthwhile. The second experience I have is probably an experience we've all shared is you know, the uh, shortages that occurred during the pandemic. Because of these shortages, a lot of common items are not available and it kind of gave a little bit of insight into how you know, fragile our supply chains are. And therefore, perhaps maybe what we think is stable and available isn't quite as stable and available as we hope. And therefore, maybe we should be taking some lessons from that. Maybe we should be learning from it and saying, while times are good, while things are available, we should be preparing for eventualities where for example, like pandemics or other disasters where supply chains might be broken or there could be other problems that prevent us from being able to have, for example, international shipping or uh, manufacturing is disrupted. And so I wanted to make a radio that would be resilient to these kind of disruptions. And so I started a couple of years ago to make the RF Bitbanger. And it's been a long process of going through many revisions of the radio. It's deliberately kept super simple, and of course compromises have to be made when you're doing that, but I think the result is worthwhile, and it provides that basic functionality that might be needed in the event of a serious crisis, but without requiring significant, the uh, difficult to get components or significantly difficult to build hardware. So we're probably, most of us are familiar with the semiconductor shortage and it's been going on for the last few years. It might be getting to be let up, but you know, cars can, are still expensive to buy and uh, consumer electronics are expensive to buy. And of course our amateur equipment also uses semiconductors. So this impacts amateur radio as well. The question is what can we do about it? Now the good news is that Amateur radio equipment, of course, nowadays is extremely capable equipment. It's versatile. It's really hard to go wrong in day, nowadays when you're buying amateur radio equipment. But the bad news is if this breaks, it's really hard to fix yourself and the parts are specialized or even unique. So in the event it breaks and there's an extended supply shortage, you may not be able to get the parts to fix your radio or, you know, even... If you find someone to fix it, they might not be able to get the parts. And in an emergency communication situation, you know, for example, bringing around your go kit radio, you know, you're probably going to be subject, subjecting your equipment to a lot of uh, uh, possible damage. And then fixing it in the field might then be an option. The parts you won't need to fix your radio may not even be available in an extended emergency. So in an emergency, in a way, less is more. And um, an emergency radio should provide a minimum core
communications functionality while being simple and reliable and maintainable so that we can guarantee that, capa that capability is there when we need it. So I'd like to introduce to you the RF Bitbang, or a radio that's intended to hopefully address some of these concerns. So the idea is it's supposed to communicate arbitrary alphanumeric messages reliably over tens to thousands of kilometers using low power un, un, with unfavorable propagation, because of course we can't choose the propagation conditions when there's an emergency. It does not require specialized skill such as CW to operate. And the reason for this, of course, is, you know, uh, CW, CW operators are only a fraction of, you know, amateur radio operators nowadays. Um, it has maximal functionality to be useful as an ordinary QRP HF transceiver. And the reason why that should be is I would like people to use this not just during an emergency, but during ordinary, for ordinary communication so that they'll be practiced using it so that when an emergency does come along, they're not, you know, learning to use it then. It should be constructible and repairable using only common tools such as a soldering iron and only use the most common components that would be in a hobbyist junk box. So um, that way the parts are available and the tools are available to repair it when it needs to be repaired. And it should be open source hardware and software so that will be duplicated, widely disseminated and in place when an emergency occurs. So to I, I created a new digital mode called SCAMP specifically for this radio that I hope will catch on. And so why do we need another digital mode when there's already so many? Well, this one is designed to absolutely try to get the message through, even if it's very slow. And it's supposed to do it just on an 8-bit processor, not require a PC or sound card, which may be difficult to lug around during an emergency. It should just be implementable on a microcontroller itself. And so it uses similar approach to say FT8 and other modes like that, where, where it communicates at a low symbol rate and with forward error correction to achieve high rel reliability communication. And with this mode, you would enter your message, say on a keyboard or using radio buttons. And then you could then see your message on a LCD on the radio and then read the response also being decoded off the air on the LCD. And it should have maximal functionality as a QRP receiver. So um, it should have, so it includes built-in CW Morse code. So it actually will do Morse code encoding and decoding on the microcontroller. Um, it supports straight and iambic keys for uh, sending so that it's useful as a you know, QRP CW receiver, transceiver. It has radio teletype uh, transmitting and receiving also built in. It also uses the, it also includes single sideband phone using envelope and fre frequency modulation, which is a, basically the same method devised by PE1 NNZ for the USDX transceiver using an external microphone and push to talk button. It also interfaces to a PC sound card so that you can connect the uh, microphone and uh, headphone so you can uh, control it with WSGT-X and so do FT8 with it. So you can do FT8 with it if you want. And it also can scan for signals automatically so you don't have to be manually controlling the uh, or manually pushing the buttons to find a station. Now this uses only the simplest, most common components. Now these are intended to be either already in a person's junk box or available from Amazon, available from eBay, available from AliExpress. And so I use the 18 mega microcontroller, 18 mega 328P, because it's probably one of the most common microcontrollers ever used. The uh, SI5351A PLO, which is very common and highly capable a uh, generic HD44780 2x16 LCD display and other generic parts. So it's um, the idea of this is, this is stuff you may already own in your junk box. And if not, it's easy, it may be in someone else's. And so maintaining this should be relatively straightforward. 
So it's going to be licensed. It's licensed under the uh, Zlib license for the software. And this uh, allows, most importantly, allows for commercial use, duplication, and sale. And similarly, it's licensed under the Creative Commons license, attribution share alike for the hardware. And so it also allows for commercial use, duplication, and sale. So I'm hoping this will be uh, reproduced, sold, disseminated as widely as possible so that it's available to as many people as possible. So the specifications are for the HF band, it'll do 1.8 to 30 megahertz, and it uses two on 7,000 finals transistors. So the best performance will probably be between the 20 and 80 meter band, which will hopefully be the most important ones in practice. The, uh, it, it can do two to four watts class E output using serial resonant filters. Um, and the, the filter modules are exchangeable for each band that's used. It operates from a 12 to 14 volt one amp adapter or battery and uses less than 100 milliamps on receive. Um, it does on off keying or frequency shift keying modulations with envelope shaping and key click removal for so that there's no key click during the CW sending. It uh, uses a double sideband direct conversion receiver based on a diode ring mixer. And the reason for this is because while it does have the disadvantage, of not rejecting the unwanted sideband, it's very easy to build and maintain from simple parts and still produces pretty good audio uh, quality as long as you don't have an interference in the uh, opposite sideband. Um, it uses a PS2 keyboard for alphanumeric entry. It has adjustable RF gain and volume. Like I said, it uses a regular alphanumeric LCD display. Uh, it has accepts line in or microphone input line levels, uh, input voltage levels. And um, it has a built-in RF current meter LED so that you can adjust the length of the antenna and to maximize the brightness of the LED to deliver the most power to the antenna. So this is a rough block diagram of it. You can see that pretty much everything connects up to the main microcontroller. Um, uh, it also has uh, is controllable through the uh, serial port. So for example, you can plug in something to the serial port of the uh, 18 mega microcontroller. And you, for example, you can decoded uh, text off the air sent over the, uh, the serial port, or you can uh, input text to be sent over the serial port. This is the through hole component design. So there's both a through hole version of this and a surface mount version of this. Now the three hole version of this is probably easier to build and maintain for most, uh, for most uh, assemblers. The main disadvantage being that you have to assemble more parts to get the radio working um, because the uh, surface mount parts won't be put on the board for you. But uh, the other disadvantage of this is that the, uh, you actually have two boards here that are uh, connected by a 40 pin ribbon cable. That, and then the boards get stacked on top of each other. But the nice thing about this, of course, is that since all the parts are through hole, it should be easier to maintain and they're uh, uh, bigger and simpler for people like me who have uh, sometimes have a hard time with surface mount parts. So um, it uh, should be relatively easy to uh, just build this even though it does take a little longer. This is as opposed to say the surface mount design. As you can see here, it's all in one board. Um, now, th the nice thing about this one is this board was actually populated mostly by JLC PCB, which is a, um, a uh, PCB manufacturer. And they also will populate your board with certain basic components. And so this is very convenient for producing a large quantity of these radios. So um, to help make the radio more maintainable, even though it uses surface mount parts, I put on extra large footprints so that if a, for example, a, a through hole part needs to sub be substituted for a surface mount part, it can be done. It'll be a little bit awkward, but at least it's possible. Um, 
So, uh, of course, the uh, another nice thing about the surface mount version, of course, is it's significantly cheaper because of the uh, surface mount components tend to be cheaper than their uh, through hole uh, counterparts. So, the radio I used here is based on a uh, radio um, from a uh, W7EL, Roy Llewellyn, who uh, published this article in 1980, and then it's been updated since then. And it's a very neat, clever design called an, uh, that uh, uses a ring mixer. Um, and I basically uh, used his design for the receiver design and radio. And I adapted it to use a digital PLL oscillator, the SI5351, rather than a uh, crystal oscillator. And the, uh, the nice thing about it is it gives a very low noise, despite its uh, simplicity and its use of basic generic components. So um, the, uh, uh, it does have manual, AG, uh, manual gain control rather than AGC, which is a disadvantage, but um, uh, it is, uh, it is relatively easy to build and maintain, which is a big advantage. So I'd like to talk about SCAMP, which is the protocol briefly that's called, and it stands for Simple Conversational Amateur Message Protocol. This is the protocol I designed specifically for this radio. Um, it uses, uh, can use either on-off keying or binary frequency shift keying as the modulation layer. And it has a symbol rate of 6.9 to 33 uh, bits per second or symbols per second since it's uh, one symbol per bit. Um, and the way it works is it encodes characters in the six bit codes, and then it uses Gole forward error correction with hard decoding for the uh, error, forward error correction. Now I know that most of you are gonna to wanna to compare it with FT8, so I'm just gonna to try to do a, as fair a comparison as I can, even though it's a little bit apples to oranges. Um, so uh, please take this with a grain of salt. But um, SCAMP uses two tones, and 6.9 symbols per second with binary frequency shift keying in the slowest version of it, while FT8 uses eight tones and 6.25 symbols per second. SCAMP uses a GOLE hard decoded FEC with a 12 out of 24 code rate, while FT8 uses a low density parity check code soft decoded FCC with 91 out of 174 bits code rate. I decided not to require a global clock synchronization because I wasn't going to assume that would be available in an emergency. So I uh, synchronized uh, only off of the stream. So I use stream clock sy synchronization. Well, FT8 uh, uses global clock synchronization where it streams to every 15 seconds. And so when I calculated the uh, SNR needed for, at 2,500 hertz bandwidth at for 0.5 error rate, I got minus 29, 21.9 dB SNR. This is as opposed to 20.8 dB SNR uh, for FT8. And one of the major reasons why SCAMP may have an advantage here is because it sends bits at one third the rate um, that, as FT8 because it's only using two tones to send one bit at a time rather than eight tones to send three bits at a time. Um, so the EB over N naught is 3.7 dB for SCAMP in this case versus 5.1 dB for FT8. And it's implementable on a 8 bit, SCAMP is implementable on an 8 bit processor in Arduino, while in FT8 uses, of course, WSJT X or some other DSP. And so this is, I won't get into this, but this is the uh, performance estimate of SCAMP, both the bit error rate and the frame error probability. So, um, I put this in here, but I will say that in a lot of cases, QRM or QRN is more important than the additive white Gaussian noise. So uh, the encoding is fairly uh, is fairly simple. You take each uh, character of the message and you encode it to a six-bit code. You pair up each two uh, six-bit codes into twelve bits. You then add twelve bits of parity to each twelve bits of uh, code to get 24 bits, and then add six self-synchronizing bits so that this stream, the receiver can say synchronized with the sender, 
and then you transmit those 30 bits as a frame. And so it, uh, this, you, know, you basically, for uh, 12 bits of payload, send 30 bits of message. And then you, when you decode it off the air, you, you re receive the 30 bits of the uh, message, and then you basically check to see if those sync bits are in place or if they're lead or lag. And if they're lead or lag, you can basically shift the bit stream to try to align the sync bits to where you think they should be. And then you uh, check the syndromes to try to decode the uh, 12 bits based on the 24 bits of the goal A code. And then you turn it back into the six bit symbols and then you get the, uh, 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 the message back. So to, um, to give you a little flavor of what it's like operating this, so the frequency is tuned by using a left-right button or an up-down button to increment or decrement the uh, digit and to choose what digit you're going to, uh, to select. You can also use number keys on an external keyboard to enter the frequency. And when you're tuning the frequency, you'll often use this bar graph indicator to maximize the uh, alignment of the frequent signal with the internal filters so that you uh, the decoding amplitude is maximized. So you're basically trying to maximize that, uh, that bar graph when you're uh, trying to decode a signal. So you, you can select the mode by using the transmission mode menu and you can, there's several options, CW, RIDI, the uh, si single sideband or the various scamp mode variations. So, um, uh, of course, if you use the uh, CW, you're going to be using probably a paddle to send. Uh, if you're using upper or lower sideband, you're going to be using an external microphone and a push to talk button. All the other modes use text entry. Um, so here's an example of entering a message through the keyboard. So um, when you're entering a message, um, the top line is the message you're entering and the bottom line is the message that's being decoded off the air. So while you're continuing to enter your message, you can see the message that's continuing to be decoded while that's happening. So, uh, and then when you're done, you can hit enter and then tell it to transmit the message. As I mentioned before, the, uh, the radio has switchable band modules for each uh, band that you might want to transmit on. Now, if you select a different band, and you want to transmit, it will send you, it'll put up a reminder that you should switch out the band module so that you're transmitting into the correct band module. So here's an example of the radio being connected for CW. Um, you go into something called the key menu, the key option, and then uh, you can uh, use paddles or a straight key to send, uh, to, uh, to send using the key. And meanwhile, it will also decode off the air, showing you the uh, decoding on the lower line. And here is an example of it being connected to a USB sound card so that you can, fit, for example, control it using WSJT-X and FT8. And so in that case, you'd set up WSJT-X for Vox control, and then you'd set the RF bitbanger to the external control mode. I encourage you to see it for yourself. Uh, all of the uh, software, hardware, schematics, PCBs, they're all up on the GitHub and they're all available to be downloaded or cloned. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, I'd like to thank the Open Research Institute for supporting this. Um, uh, please visit their website. Um, they've been uh, very helpful. And um, hopefully by the time you see this, there will be a kit available from the Open Research Institute that you can order. So um, if there is, then I, uh, I hope you order it and uh, enjoy the radio. So uh, uh, thank you very much for attending the talk, and I'm ready to accept any of your questions.